Hi, hello, you've um, joined Three Seconds Ahead. Thank you for joining us. My name's Andrew Johnson. And, and at Three Seconds, I get the opportunity to have conversations with ordinary people who've got extraordinary stories to tell. And um, by hearing those stories, I get an opportunity to tap into other people's wisdom and, and learn things, and hopefully you can too. My guest today is uh, Gerald Garner, who is very well known in Johannesburg. He um, does walking tours. Um, he has an event space and a restaurant. And he um, is someone that I have a great admiration for. Um, in actual fact, I, I probably knew him longer than I thought because he was at school across the railway line from me, which we discovered. And I also think in the same year, um, but he's more than that. He's, he's a father and, as I said, a businessman. He's authored a number of books. Um, he's, he's a tour guide, as I said, and, and a trailblazer in, in many ways. Um, I know him best from a, the first tour that I did with him. And I can tell you the date. It was on the 20th of August, 2016, because I made a journal entry that day. Um, and it had a profound impact on me. My perception of the city up until that day was one of squalor, of no hope, um, a monument to the failure that South Africa either was or would be one day. And I walked away from that experience um, with a completely new perspective. And it was largely due to Gerald's amazing, amazing storytelling ability. And I'd like to share with you, uh, Gerald, if I may, what I wrote in my journal on that day. I wrote an exceptional experience. The perceptions that have shaped my prejudices have been shifted. We live in the most exciting dynamic city in the world, a city that has reinvented itself, literally rebuilt itself every 20 years. We find ourselves at the dawning of a new spring. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. That is what that's the gift that you gave me on that day and ever since then our friendship has grown and we've touched base on different areas but i want to start by thanking you for that gift because it really means the world to me because joburg is an amazing place so um uh, you. i appreciate that <laughs> yes but I think what's really important that, 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 you, that I'd like to share with everybody is that you strike me as somebody that has a massive passion for the Josie inner city. Um, you have a tremendous compassion for the residents of the city and in particular, the migrant uh, communities. And you also are a man of tremendous resilience because um, most people would view your, your circumstances as insurmountable, but yet you find a way to push through. And, and what, during this COVID-19 experience, this lockdown, you've done that again. And sort of no matter what gets in your way, you maintain an optimistic demeanor, which is very difficult sometimes, mm -hmm. and you just find a way to move forward. Um, and I certainly admire that. And during these difficult times, um, I, would, I would like to know more about you and how you managed to do that. So my first question to you, uh, Gerald, is for those people that don't know you and haven't had the experience that I've had is sort of where does your story begin? Sure. <laughs> well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> it can begin wherever you want it to. <laughs> To find the beginning is never easy, but um, no, I mean, we're obviously talking about in the context of my, my life and work in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's not something that I planned ever or foresaw coming, and up till today, it is very much a matter of surviving this crazy place we call Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> It's in so many ways a city that's made for survivors. Yeah, people can do anything and you just get through and um, there's space for anyone. Um, but yes, um, I grew up in Pretoria. As you mentioned, we both went to school there. Um, and I actually studied in um, Turkey's University of Pretoria originally. Um, and then 
this was early 90s and um, 1990s, actually traveled overseas. You know, just after we became a democracy, mm -hmm. um, took a gap year and traveled the world. Um, and I've always been fascinated by architecture and cities. I studied landscape architecture originally. So it was quite an uh, eye opener for me in, in that time to actually see how different the rest of the world is, how exciting it is, how mm -hmm. much we learn from the rest of the world. Um, I then returned to South Africa in 1995 and um, went to study at Rhodes University, um, journalism at that stage, and then thereafter came to Johannesburg. Um, and like most people, you know, at that time, ended up in quite a comfortable life in Joburg, um, running a magazine publishing company that I founded and eventually sold to another publisher. And I managed the entire company and all the staff of like 45 people for 10 years. And everything was very comfortable, suburban Joburg life. <laughs> like yep. a lot of us you know. Um, and then one day driving to work on the M1 highway to would meet in an endless traffic, same routine every morning. I just asked myself, I can't do this for the rest of my life, can I? It was very exciting, but you know, the company was established, the magazines were running, the excitement of, of struggling and starting something was over and I felt in the rut. So I actually ended up selling uh, my part, my share in the business to my then business partner who was willing to take it on. And I literally ended up unexpectedly with nothing to do. <laughs> um, which was very exciting at that moment. Um, had I realized that the, the amount that I sold the share for was never as much as I thought it was. I mean, you know, in terms of money is not worth a lot, you know, once you actually have to look after yourself. Um, that was then near 2010. Mm -hmm. Actually, 2009, around there, I still actually consulted for that business until 2011. But basically, I had a lot of free time around the World Cup time that mm -hmm. year. Um, and there in my, in my interest or by being intrigued by inner city of Johannesburg was reignited. I was always interested in town. I have an architecture and planning background. Even in our magazines, a lot of them published were for the planning professions. So I always knew something about Joburg, yet I didn't know Joburg very well. I grew up in Pretoria, I studied in other, other places. And I do have a family history though, going back to the gold rush. It okay. also got me in the city though. Um, so what happened is around 2010, I decided to write a book because I had time. And I realized having dealt with a lot of international journalists in the previous years in the publishing industry, that people come to South Africa and they miss Joba completely. They think there's nothing to do here. You know, they go and see the beautiful nature. So I thought there's some, all these people are going to come to Joba. Joba is going to be a major host of the World Cup. Maybe I should write a book and tell people what to do in Joba. Um, unfortunately, I thought of the idea a bit too late. <laughs> so <laughs> I finished the book of time of the World Cup, there was no ways. But I actually spent most of 2010 actually researching um, the history of Johannesburg and, and putting together a guidebook, which I thought would be predominantly focusing on the parks, areas, and the cool places to hang out. Mm -hmm. And I decided, well, you know, there is some really interesting architecture history and the history of the gold rush in the city. So let me introduce a chapter on downtown Joburg. And so I set out one day with my camera to Newtown and decided to walk through town, absolutely petrified, like <laughs> ever before. Because the perception is you're not going to survive walking through town with a proper camera and taking pictures. But I did spend the entire day in town and came home Oh, this is what you described of the tour. My perception changed so much in that day. I'm exploring myself and I decided, no, the majority of the book actually had to be about town. I'm going to write a guide and exclude the inner city. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up publishing a book in 2011. And from there, the city consumed me. And that was almost a decade later and I'm still stuck in town, yes? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, that is, it's, a, it's an incredible story. I didn't realize that you had come from, as you described it, that comfortable suburbia life, which I can relate to because I live that. Um, uh, I can also relate to your story because I also left a comfortable corporate life to, to work in a design business. And yes, you, the amount of money that you have, you don't, it's never enough when you've got to do it on your own. Um, so <laughs> I can definitely re relate to that. But, <laughs> but it, it does make life very exciting um, and very interesting and, and, and in many ways challenging. Uh, so I, I think the question that pops into my mind with your relationship with uh, the Joburg inner city is um, what does she give back to you? I mean, because you've described how much you've given and I've given a, a rundown of what you do there, but you must get something from the city that keeps you there and that keeps motivating you to carry on to tell its story. Yo, <laughs> you're asking really good questions. Um, Andrew, it's, 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 it's a tough one to answer um, because it's actually quite complex. Um, for me, I think why I love Joburg Inner City so much is because of its diversity mm -hmm. and its rebelliousness. <laughs> because if you trace the story of the city, it has sort of always, you know, if I'm allowed to say, put the middle finger up at the yes. establishment. Uh, please, and you can even use the word. <laughs> <laughs> has always found his own way and has always done the opposite and has always been accommodating. I mean, there are so many examples of that, you know, of, you, know, you can go back to the gold rush and all the English migrants arriving here not being welcome and being looked down upon, mm -hmm. yet the people made it happen. You can go to the apartheid era where the cities are supposedly for white people and preferably for Afrikaner white people. But even so, everybody else said, so what? We don't care and went mm. on, you know? The yeah. English business community went along. The city never completely complied to apartheid regulations. There was always a, a, you know, a sense of mixed race activity um, in the city. Um, and I think that is why even today, the inner city is a city of migrants with so many people there who are technically unwelcome because there's something in Joburg that's accommodating in spite of all of this mm -hmm. hate in the bigger yeah. society. And I mean, maybe it, it appeals to me personally so much because, I mean, I had a bit of a little emotional moment 20 minutes before this talk <laughs> where I had a little experience that upsets me and I always had a childhood reaction to it, yes. you know, that we sometimes have. But it is the case of not fitting in or not being regarded good enough to fit in. Um, and in my life experience, I've had a lot of that because um, I grew up with an English name and surname in Afrikaans community. Mm -hmm. And there was always frowned upon, you know? Yes. So you, you're not Afrikaans enough. At the same time, my entire life, I've had an Afrikaans accent when I speak English. So I also am not English enough you know, yes, <laughs> when yeah. it comes to that. Um, and then, you know, obviously I'm white, so in other cases I'm not black enough, and so it carries on. Yes, you know? yeah. so that experience of, of not being good enough in so many regards for groupings of people, I think it will make me love Johannesburg because in, in inner city Johannesburg, yes, of course, lots of groupings, but the city is welcoming. The city yeah. is accommodating and you don't get everywhere in this country i think uh, that that is something that touches certainly touches my heart because you i grew up in an environment as i said my my initial understanding of what i've been taught about the city was that it wasn't welcoming um and it's almost like it, it welcomes people in that embrace the city and they don't care who you are, what you are, as long as you put the city first, everybody will look after one another. That, that's what I've heard you say. Um, I also loved your description of its rebelliousness and, and the way that despite what um, convention subscribes it should be, it basically raises its middle finger and says, no, we will be 
what we want to be. And the people that love this place will define what that is. Um, so that, that rebelliousness is, is really something that stands out for me. And which is led, leads me to my next question. Your, your description of your, your story of going on the M1 saying, was this going to be the rest of my life? Would you describe yourself as somewhat of a, of a rebel? <laughs> um, yes, with a cause. For sure. <laughs> with a cause. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I, I don't think I would be an obvious rebel in the sense that I'm one of those people who would actually try to conform, mm. you know, to rules and regulations and systems as long as they make sense. Yes. Now, I'm not an obvious rebel on day one that will stand up and start rebel rebelling as such. But I do find it very um, discomforting and uncomfortable, if I can put it like that, to deal with prejudice. And there's mm. so much of that in our society. And that's what I enjoy about being in the inner city is that and maybe, maybe I imagine it, I don't know, but for me, it's a, a society of more acceptance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because there's so much diversity in it. Um, yes. I'd like to change a little tech uh, for a little bit now and, and talk about your resilience. Uh, and um, it's of interest to me because in the relatively short time that we, I've got to know you, you've had to, to um, create a business. And just for those who don't know, Gerald's business is called Joburg Places. It's, um, it's walking tours. There's the Thunder Walker, which is a... Um, a venue in the Gandhi Square. He's got the Zweepy Underground, which we've had amazing dinners at and drinks. Um, you've got the Scatlings Arcade and the Town Square Banqueting Hall. And if I, I stand corrected, but you had your first wedding there just before the shutdown took place. Um, I think I saw some photographs that you posted. I mean, it looked absolutely beautiful. And, and from the photographs of your guests, they looked like they had such a great time. So you've had to create this place um, in, in, a play, in an environment where those guests in particular found it very difficult to see the beauty of it, yet you've managed through thick and thin to get people to come there. Um, you've had the xenophobic week of chaos. You've had um, finance um, and landlords not helping out, etc. Yet you've found the energy and the, the drive to keep it going. Where do you think that comes from? How do you maintain that energy and that focus? <laughs> Yo, Andrew, there are various answers one can give to that. I mean, the first one, I often say to people, it is very simple, sheer stupidity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can again people, relate to that. <laughs> some people would say it's being brave, but I say brave and stupid are oh, synonyms in many cases, actually. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, mean, I just really don't actually know exactly how to answer it. I mean, there are some times when I think I can, maybe I just don't understand reality and maybe sometimes I'm really foolish and, you know, life would be so much easier if I just understand what are the boundaries and don't try and push them, you know, yeah. as such. Um, but... I think for me, I mean, you know, my story in the inner city has been tough in the sense that I mean, Job of Places as a tour business has always done well and we love doing that. But we've attempted three property projects. You know, first the Sheds of One Fox, then the Hangout Josie and Josie Big Later One Eel of Another, the Thunder Walker at um, Gundy Square. Now, in all three of those cases, I am in a position that I'm not wealthy enough to outright purchase the entire building and develop it finance and build it into what I would like to. And if I could have done that, it would have been so much simpler, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, we do think where we are now, the Thunder Walker, we have a better arrangement that actually going to enable us to own part of the property in the end to make it all work. But honestly, um, if it was, if my motivation was to create a financially successful project, then I would have given up a long time ago because to make a financially successful project, there are much easier options, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I buy seven townhouses and rent them out and mm -hmm. after 10 years, I could 
you did it. You know? yeah. <laughs> Does it brain cells as such? For me, for me, um, it's more a case of doing something that is actually mentally challenging and therefore personally rewarding. And that has to do actually with the bigger picture of downtown Johannesburg. I really do somehow believe that the future of our entire country is locked up in downtown Johannesburg. And it has seen such bad times and such decline, but also those moments where you can see, yes, what it can be. Um, and I, I, for me, it's, it's a much bigger thing. That's what motivates me is by doing something that is, has a bigger meaning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, some days it feels quite mundane if you have to worry about, you know, do you have restaurant stock or are you going to get guests at night? And, you know, you're trying to worry about the bigger thing, but that's the reality is you sweat the small things. Um, but, so, I mean, that's part of my answer. The other part I just want to mention is, you know, you see it as resilience. And a lot of people have told me during this COVID time how resilient I am, how optimistic I am, and how they can't believe I keep on coming up with the next thing. And I appreciate that people see that. I mean, it's really lovely. But the reality is maybe somewhat different. <laughs> the reality is much more case of, okay, we have no other choice. We have to survive. We have no other choice. We don't have a massive amount of money stuck in a bank account. Everything went into this project already. It's not complete. And if we don't survive, we are going to lose everything. And so would our staff already struggle a lot because we have not had, um, you know, support as such. So um, it's a case of, of having to um, survive. And the other thing I want to mention is a case of not having so much to lose. Mm -hmm. um, because if you have a lot to lose, you would be very afraid of trying something new you know, of being resilient, of trying the next mm. thing, um, you know, and that's interesting if I had to tell you, um, if you asked me in 2006, let's say all of this happened in 2006, I probably would have been far more cautious, you know, mm. but um, because of a number of things, you know, that I've experienced in life, including going on my own into business and getting into town, and this one stage getting divorced, and sort of ending up with that, you know, the wonderful, comfortable package that was there at some mm. stage. It's easier to be resilient because you have no choice and you have less to lose, actually. So I don't think it's as, as admirable as people think it is. <laughs> it's it's simply being realistic. And I think um, I appreciate your, your honesty because it's a reminder to all of us that um, behind everything, as we say, a boer market plan, you just, you have mm -hmm. to make it work. Um, and when you, when you don't have a lot to lose, and, and the way I heard that was, is that, I mean, you rent your apartment, you don't live in the comfortable suburbs anymore. Um, you live in the inner city. So, you have your business to lose, but you can start another one. That's fine. It may be difficult, but you don't have this um, yoke around your neck that is actually making it very difficult for you to move forward. Have I understood you correctly? Yeah, no, I think you, you are right. And, if, and I think there's also a realization that came to me over time is that, you know, the value you have or the asset you have, you know, is who you are and what value you can bring to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that is an asset which in the business terms is also going to mean, you know, a, a, a way of thriving and, and, and existing. Um, physical things are not that valuable, actually. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, we have discovered in this time, even as much as our business is built on a beautiful venue, the essence of our business is built in the story of Johannesburg, mm. which we could call anywhere. And even if we had nothing left of what we had, we would still have our knowledge of our business. We would still be able to earn income. <laughs> <No>. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's really powerful. It's, 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 it sounds to me like it's, it's been liberating because 
you've been forced to look inward and say, actually, what is it that we do? And I'd like to suggest that it's not just the story that you have, is that you have a, an amazing reputation as someone that is very good at telling that story. Um, tell, you tell it honestly, um, and you have integrity. And the guests all around the world who we happen to join, two of them from Belgium, and we joined you for the virtual tour, everybody appreciates that. So it's, it's been, I think maybe one of the lessons you could have learned, so if, if with your permission I could share with you, is, is that, is that um, the, the, the value lies in, as you said, the story, and that anybody can, you can tell it from anyone. I mean, you're basically telling it on Zoom at the moment, and that's not at the Thunderwalker. So, um, exactly. yeah, mm -hmm. so, so that's a really powerful lesson to say at the end of the day, I know who I am. I know what the story is that I will tell. And that's really what I'll take with me. The bricks and mortar geez, you can build another building if you have to. So no, that's a, exactly. I mean, Andrew, I want to add to that is, um, you know, it's, I, I don't know exactly how to word it, but for me, um, you know, my, you have higher ideals. And I mean, you know, I've realized very early on when I started the, the tour business and the storytelling as such that, you know, I've always had a ability to give another look at the situation and see something that other people don't see. Um, so it was wonderful for me to get an opportunity to tell that story and get people's reactions and tell people, change people's perceptions. Um, somehow, but I would like to say that was the departure point, mm. you know, the departure point was, okay, you know, yeah, I have a good knowledge of history and architecture. I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me do a few tours, you know, because people mm. ask me once I wrote the book. Um, but the most rewarding thing that's ever come out of it is the um, ability, which I don't know if it's a gift or whether it's a privilege or how to put it, but that thing of actually working with people and changing their perceptions. Mm. It is the most rewarding and also the most humbling thing. Mm. And we do experience it day after day. I mean, to be honest, last night we had a virtual storytelling for a group of German guests who live in Pretoria, but they're all um, expats to on short-term work. And some of them are waiting to be um, repatriated, you know, at the moment. Um, so it was a tough storytelling for me and Charlie. It was a story of Joburg in South Africa. To people who live here, but they don't have all the background, you know, to, to really comprehend it all. And um, a lot of questions, a lot of debate, and I sort of went to sleep last night thinking, oh, wow, they must think we're crazy and nothing made sense, you know. I yeah. probably think they wasted their time, you know, mm. having to listen to all of this. And then this morning, I got this incredibly beautiful long email about how this just changed the entire perception of their town in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, that money can't buy, you know, yeah. that's the action. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is, that is, you are, you really are in the, in the most, gentle of ways you re you re-educating people uh, and um, you have a way of allowing uh, getting people to allow you to get into their hearts and, and I speak from my experience because that's exactly what happened to me with um, the storytelling I mean Joburg when I was born in Cape Town and then the day after our tour I always used to tell people I'm a Cape Townian because I was born there but I, I lived there for six weeks I grew up in Johannesburg. After that tour, I changed to say, I'm a Joe Burger. I've, I've, I've come from the city. And it was massively powerful for me. And I'm, I'm, I share that with you because it's important to know because it's the same as what the Germans went through. And, mm -hmm. and again, we circle back to what we said earlier is, is that really, what do you have to lose? You can't lose it. The story resides within you. And the way that you share that story is your, it belongs to you. No one can ever take that away from you. And whether you do it from your apartment in the inner city or from the Thunder Walker, people will still come and flock to come and listen to it because there's an honesty and, an, and a genuineness to it that, is, that nobody else can do. So um, I, 
I feel it's important to share that with you because that's the lesson that I've learned from you today is ask yourself the question is really how much do you have to lose? If you have your own integrity, if you trust yourself, if you really know who you are and the value that you add to the world, then how much do you really have to lose? Exactly. Exactly. It's yeah. <laughs> actually lovely just also hearing it from someone else and, and actually realizing how true that is. You know, yes. because even I forget that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the whole purpose of this discussion is to remind ourselves of the things that we already know, but we've forgotten. <laughs> um, so, so, Gerald, we, we're coming to the end of the discussion, and I always like to ask this question for those that are listening to us is, um, what lessons um, through your life or even through the last 50 days um, would you like or, or message would you like to give those people to help them get through those times where you've got to start again? Because that's really what's happening is that we're all beginning again now. And there's a few principles or basics that we can fall back on, but we often forget. So in your so many experiences of having to begin again, what one or two lessons would you, would you like to share with those people out there? Yo, <laughs> you are such pertinent questions. Um, yo, this is a really tough one. I think, I think maybe one of the most important things for even for me is really difficult because, um, you know, like believing in the city and the work we're doing in the city and in projects and buildings and so on, you know, you have a vision, you want to complete something, you know, you want to achieve. Um, but I think the most important thing in life is to not focus so much on the outcome, hmm. not focus so much on the result of the vision because it's actually what happened now that matters. You don't even know if you are going to be there to see the vision anyway. Um, so it's a very tough thing, but I mean, it's COVID-19 is such a good example of that. You can live for 50 days in hiding, waiting for it to go over so you can get back to, you know, what your vision was, what you want to do. I think the most important is to adapt, go with the flow, and live in the moment. Mm. Um, because that's the only way you can actually in the end get somewhere anyway. Um, so for me, that's the case. I mean, if you have to restart something, yes, you have to have an idea. Yes, you have to have a plan. All those things are important, but you don't have to be so fixated on the outcome. Yes. I mean, let me give you one small example to make it practical, is now we have this beautiful old bank building, which we call the Thunder Walker which, you know, the whole idea was to make it a tourism destination with hotel and restaurants. Um, but you now restaurants are not going to work for the next year. You know, yeah. they're not going to be financially viable. And who knows if the hotel will actually be a good idea. We still have to ask ourselves that. But I mean, we already realized that we just have to forget about the restaurant for a while. Mm. You know, if I'm so excited with that ideal, that goal, um, it's not going to work. And we already realized that we were collecting beautiful things in the city anyway, in terms of furniture and antiques and um, things that represent Joe's diversity from tea sets to coffee to whatever. And we can very easily turn the whole place just into a wonderful destination treasure shop yes. of things you know, that people associate with Johannesburg. And then people don't have to sit down and eat. And we can maybe still you know, make it financially viable. So I think it is very important to be adaptable or willing to adapt. It's actually more, it's more mm. important to be willing to adapt, you know, in the times that we live today. You know, if you're fixated on one thing in one way, that way may not work. Mm. You know, they may, may need to come up with something else. Um, yeah, I think that is really profound uh, is that, focus on the process and i mean just going back to you saying i did tours and i didn't really think that i'd profoundly change people's lives i was just taking them on a tour because i wrote a book but the process of taking them on tours has given you the gift the opportunity to change people's perceptions on the inner city but you didn't know you were going to do that that's how it ended up um exactly yeah. exactly and i mean i think so often 
human beings or people lose the most amazing experience or miss out on the most amazing experience opportunities in life because they don't put themselves in that position they don't follow the, the process so they focus on that outcome and everything on this side of miss you know? yeah absolutely i think it's that, that's something i mean i woke up this morning and in my mind was it it's it's the step before the end that matters because if you don't do the step before the end you're not going to get to the end whatever the end looks like True. Yeah. Anyway, Gerald, I think um, we've um, come to the end of our, our conversation and I could go on for a couple more hours. Definitely. I don't know about you. Maybe there's a second one in a few months time, but I really would like to thank you for your time and your openness and your um, willingness to be vulnerable. Um, I really appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing you when we can and opening a bottle of wine. I know most South Africans are looking forward to that opportunity. Indeed, I hear yes. a lot. <laughs> but, um, but thank you very much. The views and opinions expressed by this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Three Seconds Ahead. Any content provided by our authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. While authors strive for accuracy, we can and will be wrong at times, as any honest person will have to admit.